right. So welcome everybody to uh, the workshop where we're going through fitness tonight. So um, because we're going through fitness, I had to make sure somebody fit was up here. So I invited Mr. Ryan Walker. And, uh, so Ryan, he's a he's a he's a train. Give him your credentials. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up as a as an athlete mainly, and then from there. I took a, an interest in uh, strength conditioning, athletic development. Um, I started doing the, the CrossFit thing for a while and looking into different methods. And um, yeah, from there it just kind of evolved into more of an interest in health and wellness as a, as a whole. And that's, uh, that's really what brought me here to Dr. Mike is kind of his mission and getting the knowledge out to everybody because knowledge is power. I didn't just come up with that. So, but that's essentially essentially it. Athlete, coach, strength conditioning coach. It, it was really interesting the way that I got hooked up with him because, uh, right, you you would come into Red Bar, and uh, I got this message that this super super duper excited guy came in and was like all excited about everything, and you know was was all talking it up, and then and then I didn't hear anything for a while, and then uh, and then um, you're the, the the owner of the gym. Over there, Sean. Yep. Uh, he came in through, I guess, uh, referral. Somebody, one of the one of their clients came in and got started. Uh, had awesome results. She hooked me up with him. We met. We talked, and he got started over here. And then, and then Ryan ended up working there at the gym. And then he came in and he was like, "Wait a minute, you know." And we uh, we made the connection there. But uh, as soon as I met him, I knew we had to we had to get this guy on board. He's uh, knowledgeable, and I like firecrackers, so uh, <laughs> he's a he's a firecracker. <laughs> um, so the the idea behind the workshop this was actually his idea, I believe. Uh, you know, the magic fitness formula, you guys recognize this, is one of the old elixir bottles. You know, everybody's looking for the elixir, the, oh, yeah. you know, the, the thing that fixes it all. And that's the irony. With, with uh, fitness, there is no elixir. There's no magic potion. Uh, you, you have to work. There's nothing you can take to just make it magically happen. In fact, uh, the, the classic example I like to use are, you know, the, are the, the people who have huge muscles, you know, just muscles stacked on top of muscles. You never see those guys win uh, marathons. You never see them win races, sprints. You never see them win, uh, you know, Spartan races and stuff like that. Anything that is about endurance, they tank, you know. So th we've got this idea that big muscles mean strength, but that's not really true. Uh, big muscles just mean big muscles. That's about it. You can blow up muscles. You can use supplements and stuff to make them large, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're fit and dense. So the idea behind this workshop, we want to show you how to do some just basic fundamentals. Uh, we're going to do that at the end. That's going to be fun. That's going to be interactive. So you guys will actually be lifting up some weights tonight. Uh, and... Uh, but we're going to go through some of the basics, the things that you've got to know up front so you know the ground rules before you start any kind of exercise, okay? So this is going to be good stuff. Uh, normal posture, we're going to start off here because uh, you really need to know what normal posture is because exercise needs to be all about posture. It needs to be all about maintaining good posture, maintaining good form because how do injuries happen? Bad form. Bad form, bad posture. So the, the bad posture forms, you can have increased lordosis where your hips rotate. You know, you just imagine that's on a crank and your hips rotate forward so it gives you an increased lumbar lordosis. Well, when, you're in, when your lumbars go forward, your head has to go forward to compensate. So you see the head forward here. Uh, you've got kyphosis where the thoracic spine rolls backwards. And when it rolls backwards, your head and your hips have to roll forward to, to do that. You see my knees drive posterior. You know, see so you see people walk around like that. You've got flat back where the pelvis actually rotates backwards and then that flattens out the lumbar spine and of course the head and the thoracics have to go forward. This is, uh, this is like ballerina posture, right? You know, they train ballerinas. My wife was a dancer and you know, they train them to to you know, suck in their stomach and get everything real flattened out, but that flattens out that lumbar curve. And then this last one, sway back, where again, the hips roll posterior, but it throws the, the thoracic spine back with it, and then your head and your hips and everything. This is old man's posture, right? You know, where they're walking around like this, hey. You know, so <laughs> you've, 
you, you know, Creepy all of these postures. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little scared, right? Uh, so these are abnormal postures. When you, when you have good posture, you should have your ear directly over your shoulder, hip, knee, ankle, all the way down. Everything should be in good alignment. And so when you're exercising, you want to keep that good form. You know, the, the classic example is people doing uh, dumbbell curls. You know, and you see them, and they're like this. They're hunched over with the dumbbells, their heads forward so that they can see their biceps, right? You know, and they're, they're curling like this. It's terrible posture. You want to make sure that you're always in that good posture no matter what exercise it is that you're doing, okay? Pillows. This was one, yeah. Okay, so pillows. We're going to be jumping back and forth on here. We are taking turns. Uh, we, we, uh, we're, we're sharing the load tonight. Um, so pillows, earliest date, 9,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia. By the way, why am I talking about pillows? Because I hate them. I, was I hate pillows. Pillows are the worst invention ever. And so I'm proving to you right now that pillows are the worst invention ever. Okay, so they were dated 9,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia is when they started. And they started as rocks underneath people's heads. Why? Because they were designed to keep bugs out of your orifices. Okay, so if you still have a problem with bugs entering your orifices, right, then you still need a pillow. But that's what they were designed for, just to lift your head up off the ground. But, you know, naturally, the only thing they had at that time was rocks. I took a massive coffee break. <laughs> okay. Um, so where we were, designed to keep bugs out of your orifices. Obviously, that's not a problem anymore. So the Egyptians saw this as a status symbol that was reserved for the wealthy. Okay, this is where it really started to come into play because the Egyptians, they would put rocks underneath the pharaoh's heads when they put him in their sarcophagus, right? Because that would lift their head, which was... Uh, of course, you know, had to make it into the afterlife, and so by lifting it, they, they figured it would uh, increase circulation, which is important for dead guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so these were the factors that then went into it, uh, but this, this started the status thing, that it was reserved for the wealthy. So, of course, what happens? Once Pharaoh gets an iPhone, everybody's got to have an iPhone, right? right. It just it starts from there. So then King Henry VIII, he banned pillows for anyone but pregnant women because it was a sign of weakness, right? Uh, that was probably after the fact that they started to develop them into soft pillows because, I mean, come on, men sleep on rocks, right? But you've got to have soft pillows, you know, that's a sign of weakness, so they're banned. Uh, then millions now of web pages now sell and talk about pillows despite the fact that this is one of the most worthless items still in use today, okay? Think about it this way. Of all of the pillows that are out there, and everybody has pillows, and there's literally millions of web pages selling pillows, and everybody's got a new design of a pillow, and they're constantly coming out with new ones. Why is everybody trying to find the next design of a comfortable pillow? Because by nature, they're not comfortable. Right? right? That gives it all away. They're not comfortable. They're not meant to be used. They're not healthy. They're not good for you. So everybody's trying to, well, you know, we've got the next comfortable pillow. Well, we've figured the problem out. And at the end of the day, everybody's just selling pillows. They're all worthless. Okay? Throw away your pillows. That's, that's the moral of that story. That's me. All right. So first off, um, very, very important. Why should I care about my feet? Well, the, the feet are the foundation, the structural foundation. So if you think if we weaken the foundation of a building, what's going to happen upstream, right? It's going to be weak and it's going to be unstable. And we really need to think of our feet in that same, with that same analogy. Because essentially what we see a lot of the time is we see implements and it's like the pillows, right? Anything that essentially alters your, your neutral structure or structure, skeletal structure, is going to put you into a dysfunctional position. So with the shoes, everybody wears shoes, right? So there are a few things that we can look for, and I could go forever on, on, on shoes, but I'm not going to, I'm going to try and keep this brief. Um, we'll go ahead and, and move into the type of shoe wear to really try and stay away from. I'm not encouraging people to go run around barefoot. Um, you have seen the movement towards more of the, uh, the minimalist shoe wear. And a lot of the time, that's gone even it, it's ineffective because people still have the weakness in the feet. So now they're just, they have weak feet with a poor posture, but now they got goofy looking shoes on, right? So 
no offense to anybody has shoes like that. In fact, thumbs up to you if you are. Um, so flip-flops is a big one. I see this a lot. If you're wearing flip-flops tonight, it's okay. Don't be ashamed. You didn't know. If you wear them tomorrow, that's a different story. <laughs> you know. Okay? Uh, the flip-flops, let's just talk about briefly why. It's, it's, it's important that you understand mechanically why this, this contributes to dysfunction. Well, when I'm walking and I, the flip-flop doesn't have the heel bound into the shoe, naturally I have to do a, a foot turnout position here to keep the foot or keep the flip-flop on my foot. So next time look at somebody you know who wears flip-flops everywhere they go and you'll see that subconsciously they developed a movement pattern of a duck and you're gonna see this this feet out right I know I know and it even 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 showing you guys I don't even know how people walk like this but they do but it happens subconsciously so we have to pay conscious attention to what we're doing to our to our function um, another thing with the flip-flops is in order to keep that that flip-flop on my foot I have to contract with the big toe over and over and over and over again creating a fasciitis on the bottom of the foot now you get foot pain which is going to make you alter your positioning and your motion so now that's going to lead to dysfunction okay um, heels that's another one any any heel elevation is going to alter my center of balance pushing me forward so now what do I have to do? If I'm falling forward, what am I going to do to stay on top of myself? Overextend through my back. Okay, a little exaggerated, but over time, when you see the ladies wearing the big heels, you can only imagine, right? But then supposedly, you know, this is MTV <laughs> standards of good looking, right? Uh, so then we've got the arch supports. Now, a majority of shoes are going to have the arch developed into them, right? Um, but what we need to think about is how many of you have ever seen somebody's arm put in a cast? Or, or a leg put in a cast. And if you look at the arm or the leg after it's taken out of the cast, you'll notice that it looks very weak, right? The muscle's gone, there's atrophy there, because the body will adapt to non-utilization, right? If there's no use for it, well then the body's not going to recruit any muscle, it's not gonna create tone. So it's the same thing with, with the arch supports, you're putting your foot in a cast, right? And the arches are supposed to keep my structure on top of itself. So here's your feet, Right, but then I put them in the cast, they atrophy, they get weak, what happens? Pronation. And then this is exactly what you see, and then it leads to scoliosis, right? Curvature in the spine. But this is essentially what's happening. It's all starting from the base, right? Because you're weakening your foundation. What can we do? All right, things to do. Try and spend as much time as you can barefoot at home or walking in socks. Yes, you have a reason now. Um, not, but, but remember, yeah, but remember, it's, it's not just walking around barefoot, okay? You gotta be conscious of the pronation in your feet. And you can, you can notice it because a lot of the time you'll end up with pain on the inside of your foot or the, the kind of where the, the bunion would be, right? I don't even know what you would call that right there. You'll start to get some wear and tear there because you're walking it inside. Or you can even look at the pattern or the wear tear pattern on the inside of the shoe. Is it worn in? Well, then that probably means you're walking with, a, with some pronation in your feet. So when I'm standing, everybody can do this right now. Let's just try this real quick. Go ahead and place one or two feet on the floor and go ahead and press your big toe down into the floor, okay? Now you're going to feel those other four toes want to peel up off the floor. Now try and press those down. Can you feel how the, the center of the foot starts to get tight? You might even cramp up a little bit, really press that toe down, heel down into the ground. And what you're doing is you're, you're forcing utilization and contraction of that arch. Okay, so if you can consciously do that again and again and again as many times throughout the day, you can start to rehab that arch, get it strong again, okay? Another thing we can do is pick footwear wisely, okay? These, these other two points are essentially the same thing, just be conscious, but pick your footwear wisely. Make sure that you're finding flat shoes, right? You should, in reality, you should only have enough padding on the bottom of the foot to protect your foot from bruising when you strike. That's essentially it, because I mean, you, you, you think about, primal beings, right? I mean, they didn't, they didn't need to wear comfortable shoes with heels and arches built into them, right? And they were probably very functional people. If you look at a lot of people in the third world countries, they move perfectly. You know, I mean, they're sitting in full squats, which we'll get to in a minute. They're doing all kinds of functional daily activities is where, you know, we're sat at desks hunched over all day, okay? Um, so that's, that's uh, it kind of going back to the pillows, right? Anything that alters that natural uh, structure is going to lead to dysfunction eventually. So that's feet yes. for you. Then what <laughs> yes. kind of recommendation is for like if you wanted to start really with activity with walking mm -hmm. or running? With walking or running? Yeah. That's a good that's a good question. 
Coaching is, is one. If you, if you want to start going into fast gait moving, um, you might want to have a coach assess, which I can do. I, I coach running a lot um, because there's a lot of dysfunctional positions that you're getting into when you're running or when you're jogging that you can't see from the outside. Um, what I would do is I would address the pronation directly first. Make sure that you're not falling, the feet aren't falling in. Okay, And again, sometimes that's kind of hard to tell. Um, you might need to get a, get a friend to look at it. What you can do is you can get a friend to look at you without your shoes on and socks. And you want to look at the heel and about five, six inches above it. And that heel cord should sit straight up and down. If it's curved, that means you've got some pronation in your feet. So now, like, what kind of shoes would you wear? Uh, shoes, the, you know, the minimalist shoes are good, but like I said, if the, if the arches aren't strong, you're still going to have pronation. I've seen it. I saw a guy running the other day. He had the minimalist shoes, the toe shoes, mm -hmm. um, the Vibrams, that's what they're called. He was running, but he still landed on the inside of that foot and every time driving the inside of that knee into the floor. So shoe wear, um, you know, even I'm wearing shoes right now with, with a bit of an arch built into it, but I make sure that every day I take some time to, to strengthen those arches. So don't think that by wearing shoes with arches in them, you're going to end up with dysfunction or pronation, as long as you're being conscious of it. That's the biggest part. Okay. Um, does that answer everyone's question on that? Okay. All right. Feet are important. <laughs> no pills, okay. no shoes. Yeah. Just, just remember this. He connected flip-flops with bunions. Nobody wants bunions, all right? Uh -huh. so. Oh, did we go over Stay away from flip-flops. That must be on another slide, the pointed. But what brand of shoes? There's so many out there, and I've got to get some tennis shoes of some sort to wear um, for the cooler weather. And okay. I find that something that's got some cushion in it, mm -hmm. my knees don't hurt. Right. I mean, um, I the, Smart, yeah, what, she, what she's really saying is she only has high heels, and I told her she can't <laughs> only wear them anymore. Well, you know, for especially. But I gotta have something to work in every day, you know. So right, right. You talking about open toed? You you like open toed shoes? Toe for the for the cooler weather. Okay. Oh, you know, it drives oh, me crazy. I go and you can spend hundreds of dollars on shoes, mm -hmm. and they're miserable. Mm -hmm. Right. I was wearing pumas. And yeah. Well, look for the shoes that have are as flat as possible. The flatter they are, the closer the closer it simulates your actual foot positioning, the the better you're going to be off. You know, if you could make some kind of mold of your foot and just wear that every day and decorate the outside of it, that would be perfect. So it doesn't matter what kind of shoe for any activity. It, it, it does over time. Like I said, right now, like the very foundation of this would be build the strength in the feet. Get the, get the strength back, right? Doing the toe exercise we just did, right? Making sure that you're not falling into pronation, okay? Um, but then over time, as you start moving and running, you have to be very cautious of what kind of shoe you're going to. Because if I go from... Think about the heels, you know, a lot of people here wear heels or, you know, even guys, we have heels in our shoe, right? It is a high heel shoe, it's maybe subtle, but what it's doing is it's shortening that heel cord, right? That Achilles tendon, and if I just go out and I start running and I get this contraction here, I could, I could end up with, you know, tearing or rupturing something. That'd be a horrible place to rupture. So, yeah, so you want to go from slowly start making your way down. You can go to a lot of running shoe stores and they'll, that you can say, okay, well, this is my first time looking into a running shoe. What can I, what can I use that will keep my heel safe? And then slowly start going minimal, minimal, minimal until eventually you're flat. So, yeah, I know, I know that's not super in depth and, and detailed. I wish we could do a whole presentation on foot strengthening exercises because I could I could do that <laughs> you, you next could, yeah, I yeah. Mean, next workshop feet and it's one of those things too where it's you you know you're, you're kind of looking at after the fact also because it, it has a lot of assumptions built into it even looking into feet because so much so much of it is related to posture so much of it is related to structure shock absorption you know like like you were saying uh people going out and running i mean you see it all the time you uh doing the azalea trail run stuff like that people are out there and they're just running on the insides of their feet because you know their their posture is just terrible i mean there, there's nothing good about the overall form so it's i get what he's saying it's hard to find it's hard to just say, well, go and buy these shoes because that's only one part of it. You and know, it was, it's just, sorry. it's, it's just a small speck of the overall big picture. It's really, you've got to, you got to 
you got to fix yourself. Yeah. You know? uh, who was it? The, 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 the Vibram shoe company actually ran into a big lawsuit issue mm-hmm. where they said, we'll fix your, your running posture. And that's where they went wrong was because it doesn't fi- fix the running because the movement pattern is still ingrained into the nervous system. You, you're dysfunctional as far as the nervous system goes with your running gait, right? So they have to go in and relearn how to move again. And that's why we're teaching you today how to move correctly and identify what these dysfunctional positions look like. And you can even do some homework. Next time you're parked at a red light, you see someone running by, you can see, here's one I always see, if I'm off in a distance, I, um, this is what I pay attention to. You'll see somebody running and you'll see a leg just kind of s- sling out to the side, right? <laughs> they don't even know what's happening. They don't even know what's going on. And what it is, is they have no flexibility in their heel so when I can't get that heel to the ground, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn my toe out. I'm going to throw it back like this. And that's just one example of, of dysfunction as a result of, of shoe wear. So it, there's no one size fits all. There's no one answer for this. Everybody has different um, little bits of dysfunction. But you know, as long as you understand the fundamentals and being aware, that's the most important part. Just be aware. Be aware. All right. So basic neurology and muscle activation. Um, that we're, we're going to go into some real simple stuff on this because we can't get into all of it. Here's the way it works, okay? You get sensory information from your feet, from your knees, from your ankles, from your entire body. You're getting proprioceptive information feedback to your brain all the time. So every time you step, every time you move, it doesn't matter what you do, your body is reading through those sensors and sending that information back to your brain then your brain has to analyze all that information, right? So it analyzes in a fraction of a second exactly what's happening in every appendage across the entire body. It responds and then sends impulses via the nerve system back to the muscles to cause a proper muscle response in that exact moment. I mean, and this stuff is happening at just unbelievable speeds. It's like 240 miles an hour that, that this information is zipping back and forth. In a, con- in a continuous stream. So if you think, uh, anybody watch, uh, so you think you can dance? It's because of my wife. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, it's it's, it's, really, it's, it's, a, it's a cool show because I mean they it's it's unbelievable watching what people what the human body can do. I love watching stuff like that because you see people go and jump and make these intricate motions in the air just perfectly with precision, and it's unbelievable when you understand the neurology behind it because to process and act out that information at the same time in mid-flight before you hit the ground again is literally incomprehensible. It just it just goes once again to the power of the human body. I mean, it is unbelievable the way that this thing is built. It's unbelievable. So that information gets sent back, then your muscles respond. Now your muscles respond according to the neurological commands. That's important. They don't just act on their own. They don't just, it's like, you know, a machine, it hits and, you know, something else happens. It's acting exactly according to the information that the brain is sending it. And that's it. Okay. So whatever information is, is getting there. uh, If that information is diminished, then you're going to get a diminished response, which is going to alter gait. Uh, it's going to alter all these other things. If you have uh, nerve tension or you have pressure on a nerve, it might overexcite that that signal, and then you end up with a trolley horse or a muscle cramp, right? But at the end of the day, it's always the the muscle. You got to think about a muscle as a pretty dumb object. It's just designed to respond to that information, the electricity coming into it. Okay. Then, uh, so therefore, when you put all that into play, the objective is to purposefully trigger the brain to promote the desired effect. Okay. And here's what I mean by that: is if uh, if I go over to this wall and I want to I want to increase my strength, you know, the you don't go and do something that you can already do. Okay. I'm not going to increase my strength by, uh, you know, putting. <laughs> For some, that's yeah. progress. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, you don't do it by just by pushing something that can be moved. You do it by, and I guess I should do this one because because you can't see that wall with the camera, but, you know, if I push up against this wall, 
my brain doesn't know that this wall can't move. Okay? From a neurological standpoint, your brain, your, your mind thinks it's unlimited. So it's going to respond. So if I push on this wall and I just, I keep on coming back to this wall every day and pushing it as hard as I possibly can, your brain does not know that wall can't move. So it will continuously say, well, it didn't move. We got to work harder and it will start to feed and develop your muscles to make them grow. How does that correlate now to exercise? It's simple. When you go to lift up a weight that's heavier than you can do and you go beyond your limits, your brain responds by saying, I need to recruit more muscle. So it builds and develops more muscle. Do you see why people get bigger now? Okay. Do you see why uh, these bodybuilders can get just massive because their body realistically knows no limits? And it takes drugs. It's, and some of them take drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <It's extra. laughs> So this is really important though for you because if you want to change your exercise habits, you, you don't look at it by, uh, so many people look at it simply, well, you know, I'm going to get out and I'm going to start jogging or I'm going to go out and I'm going to start walking and they'll do the same routine for a year and a half of just getting out and going for a leisurely stroll with their cup of coffee in their hand. And then they're wondering why they're not getting anywhere, why they're not progressing. It's because you've got to push your boundaries because your brain knows you can make that walk no problem. You've done it a hundred times. Why would you need to grow and develop any further, right? It's just going to do what's efficient. And it's not efficient in that process to build and develop more new muscle. It can already do it. Does that make sense? Really cool stuff when you think about it. Okay, so uh, the next thing, understanding the sodium potassium pump. So this is this is how it all works out, and I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Uh, just just uh, eat some salted bananas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that intimidating? We were hoping it would be. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, okay, efficiency of motion versus safety and effectiveness. So. I like to look at things from a primal standpoint because we kind of have to. Genetically, we haven't changed very much at all in the past 10,000 years. We're still function like people who should be out hunting and fishing and climbing and building fires from scratch. So we have to we have to think in those from that standpoint. Um, and and kind of going back to what we were talking about, guys. Anything that's going to alter that neutral <coughs> state is uh, is eventually going to lead to dysfunction. Um, so some other things, we talked about the feet specifically, but there's some other things that we need to be conscious of. Um, one is chairs, right? Chairs is actually in itself a dysfunctional position, right? We weren't designed to sit in a fully flexed position here all day, okay? And when you see, the, the muscles will take on behavioral patterns after a while, right? Because it's, it's adapting to that environment, right? So if I told a majority of you who haven't squatted butt to the ground to get up and try and squat butt to the ground, a majority of you would get right here. <laughs> but what does this look like? It looks like a chair, right? So we have to regain that function, okay? So we can do that through taking the body through its natural ranges of motion. And you'll see this a lot of the time. Like I said, the, the muscles will take on behavioral patterns over time. So somebody who sits in a chair a lot, right? We've got muscle here that's called the psoas muscle, the hip flexor muscle, and the quads. They'll get tight, and then it starts to look. You start to see people take on these postural positions, right? And then you see people in very old age, and they get that kind of shuffle walk because they're, they're so glued up in here because they've been sitting for years and years and years, and they've never gotten into a fully functional range of motion. Okay, so the chairs, be conscious of that. Um, and, and one little ca uh, caveat here, make sure that if, if you think about, here's how you can regain some, some mobility in certain parts of your body. If you think about sitting flexed in a, in a chair and my muscles are getting really tight in this position, what would be the opposite of this position? Here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I can start to regain hip extension. That's what this is called here. So just if you think about how the muscle functions in one position, if I take it in the opposite position, that's considered the stretch. Sorry, that's just a little little tip, tip of the day. Um, slouching, that's another one, obviously, which we're gonna get from sitting, right? If I if I were sitting like this guy, um, it'd be hard. I'll try it. Wearing skinny jeans, but here it's kind of hard. <laughs> I can I can slouch, but but 
it's you'll know it's a lot easier to slouch when you're sitting at a desk at a computer, right? And again, it comes down to consciousness, it comes down to awareness. If you can just catch yourself for a brief second and start, and I and I actually did the same thing. I can say that I applied this myself. I used to have the very slouchy posture myself. You know, I would do, do a lot of bench pressing too. That didn't help, but. I had to catch myself and sit the shoulder blades back and down into a neutral position. And over time, now I catch myself sitting in a chair, kind of like a total stiff. And people look at me like, you know, who's this guy? But little do they know that I'm sitting in a, in a neutral position. Okay, so catch yourself right now. Anybody <laughs> caught themselves? Like, yeah, I caught it, but I'm comfortable. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, another one. Um, not a whole lot we can do. Uh, in, in certain situations, but working against your circadian rhythm. So this is kind of going more into the endocrinology, the hormonal aspect of things, but we were designed to, to rise with the sun and, and, and lay down with the sun, right? Sunset? You know what I mean. Um, so, so but I, you know, if you think about it, there's a book called uh, Lights Out, and it talks entirely about the, the advent of the light bulb and artificial lighting and its, its hormonal effects on, on the body and physiologically. And we were not designed to sit under lights well into the night when we should be sleeping. So that's where a lot of these hormonal issues come into play, and people wonder why, oh, why are my hormones here? And Well, it's probably because we're working against nature, and that's really what it comes down to. Nature had this perfect design in mind and we think we can come in with technology and make it better and more comfortable, you're just screwing it up. Um, all right, so be, be conscious of these things. Anything that changes, natural positioning, it's, it's no good. Try and, try and be conscious of it. Uh, key concepts, remove contributing factors to dysfunction and retrain function. Um, kind of being redundant right now, but uh, it kind of like what we talked about with the sitting, right? That's going to eventually lead to dysfunction. So what can I do? Think about the stretches and, and regaining that position. Okay, this is just one example. If I think about slouching and the muscles involved in the slouch, right? I've got the anterior delts, the pecs, the pec minor. If I can open this position up in some kind of a stretch, right? You can find all kinds of stretches online. Just punch it in YouTube and you can find an entire routine. And just, you don't need to spend three hours doing yoga every day. Just find some, find a stretch for every Part of the body hold it for at least 30 seconds to a minute again wish we could do a full workshop on this but just spend some 30 seconds to a minute in that stretch each body part takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to do every day and i'm pain free no that's not true i did that back flip <laughs> my hip's kind of bugging me um, yeah um, this is a big one here um, if there's no need the nervous system will adapt and that's what we were talking about, the body, the body will adapt to its natural environment or, or to its environment that you place in. So sitting again, try and squat where you can end up 90 degrees in the hip. Um, here you'll see glute inhibition, which sounds like a big word, but that's an example. Um, I see it all the time. Actually, because like I said, I, I, look at, I look at these things. I look at movement patterns in people. I assess people structurally when they're not looking. That's, that made it sound really creepy, but uh, you know, I'll see it all the time. You know, I'll, people come over to that to the to the neck thing, and they'll do they'll do squats. But when I squat naturally, I should break at the knees and the hips simultaneously, which we'll get more into. But I see this all the time. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like trying to rip their heads off, but all you see is a knee bend. Now, if you think about that, when we're sitting with our butts in a chair all day, and we're pancaking our, you know, these are this area back here down, right? It, it, it loses its ability to function, to turn on, and the nervous system does now kind of finds an alternate route, right? Because now it's like, oh, well, we don't need glutes anymore, right? <laughs> so it finds somewhere else to, to, to put some energy, right? So we need to learn how to retrain these positions, which we're going to get into later. Okay. I'm really glad, by the way, that you didn't... Uh like knock yourself out during the backflip. <laughs> he comes in on because like, I would have had to teach all this stuff. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, yeah, muscle contractions. You're gonna go through this one too. It's gonna be a good one. Yeah. All right, now we are gonna do a little movement. So we're gonna teach you about the three different muscle contractions, and they look like big words, but they're really, if you kind of look at the roots of the word and and what's kind of synonymous with them, you can you can figure out. Uh, we can create little. What are those called? Homonyms, but the, you know, ways to remember them easier. <laughs> I don't know, homonyms, I don't even know what Mnemonic devices. Mnemonic, 
Yeah, that's it, mnemonics. Um, so the concentric, just think of it as the, the, the rising up or the, the contraction of the muscle. Um, here I put the moving up or final movement of the exercise. So we're going to actually put this into play. So everybody go ahead and from your seated position, I want you to sit up nice and tall. I want you to plant your feet firmly on the ground. Get your feet just a little outside of shoulder width. Okay. Now, all That's you're going for. <laughs> That's outside of her shoulder width. There you go. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to lead with the torso. You're going to drive your heels down to the ground and drive your hips up. So in other words, I want you all to stand up. Stand up. I've got that. Now. Yeah, there you go. Is that better? Good job. Uh, you guys just so, learned how to stand up. All right, give yourself a hand. Uh, so that's an example of the concentric portion of a squat. It was the moving up, literally, in this case, right? And it was the contraction of the, of the glutes and the hamstrings and the quadriceps to stand up out of the, out of the chair. So now the isometric, this is going to be fun. The isometric is just the, I think iso, I can't even still. think of a good, still, just think still. still. Okay, isometric, and holding a static position or moving against an immovable object, kind of like what Dr. Mike was doing when he's pushing against the wall, that was an isometric contraction. In fact, Absolutely. Bruce Lee, everybody knows who Bruce Lee is, right? Yes. That's, that's, that was primarily what he did for strength and conditioning, was isometric contractions. I learned that from Bruce Lee. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was Bruce Lee, he was his mentor. Uh, so there's two different ways I can, I can move against an immovable object, right? And I can get the, the motor neurons or the nervous system firing off and turning on more muscle uh, fibers or isometrically. So there's different positions we can hold this from, but right now what I want everybody to do is I want you to, again, break at the knees and the hips simultaneously. So when I say break, I want to see break. So I want you to think about sticking your butt back just a little bit. You don't have to over accentuate, but just a slight bend at the knees and the hips. And I want you to slowly sit your butt back, try and find that chair. And right when you find that chair, stay about one inch above it. One inch above it. Why don't you keep going. If you feel like you're going to collapse, don't go any further. And I want you to hold that for about five more seconds. So one, two, three, four, five. Stand. Okay. Yeah. Do you see what five seconds did to you? Yeah. yeah. Pretty amazing, right? Now, here's a, here's a little, this is a caveat too, but a little, uh, a little tip for variation and or progression and difficulty. If that was really difficult for you, you could not even get close to the chair. Well, then how could I, you know, move away from that a little bit? I could just come maybe a little bit less flexion through my hip and hold this position. So for some, this might be hard. For some, this might be too easy. So you'd move down a little bit further. Okay. So you see how you can vary the intensity. Uh, and then the last one's going to be the eccentric portion of the movement, which is the lowering. Okay, so it's the, the return back to the initial position. So what I want everybody to do now is take, we're going to do a three second eccentric here. So that means we're going to take three seconds to slowly lower your butt back into the chair. Okay, ready? So we get our feet just outside shoulder width. We're going to break the knees and hips simultaneously. And one, two, three, and sit. That was perfect, perfect presentation, because now everyone's back in their chairs. That was the perfect order. If I had ended with concentric, it would have been, you guys would be standing again. You have to go through all that work of sitting again. Uh, so does that make sense? The three different, uh, you don't have to necessarily remember these words. But if but, you want to, just practice it. Every time you get up, you're, you're sitting at the restaurant all, concentric! <laughs> <laughs> And then you won't what? be welcome there. You sit down yelling, eccentric. You're eccentric. <laughs> and a lot of you probably eat a red bar, so we'll, we'll, get, a, we'll get some exposure to that. Don't, don't do isometric, though. Management will kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Midline stabilization. The, uh, so on this one, the big thing, protect your spinal curves. That, that's that's the, the big picture with all this is make sure everything we talked about so far is all about you you see that form with everything when you break at the knees and the hips you, you know and you you have it roll back your body is all in that midline posture so it's all about those spinal curves so you're supposed to have a c-shaped curve in your neck a c-shaped curve in your thoracics c-shaped curve in your lumbar spine all those should be lined up so you just want to protect those spinal curves if you do this that's bad if you do this that's bad if you know if if you do this that's bad you know any of these things where you're breaking that posture forward or back 
you you want to see those things. So that's the only excuse for guys to watch themselves in the mirror when they work out is if you're looking for your curves. The rest of it's just cheesy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a little uh, how we can protect those spinal curves is through using what's called intra-abdominal pressure, which I know sounds like a big word, but it's just the intra inside abdominal abs, right, and pressure, okay? So what we're trying to do through intra-abdominal pressure is, well, create a lot of pressure inside the thoracic cavity here, and what that's going to do is create stability around the spine. It's going to contract everything and keep the spine in a safe position. So... Some people do it right, some people don't, but I'll see it all the time. If you've ever been in a gym, you'll see some people, the way they're breathing when they're exercising, you hear that. And then they breathe out as they're coming up, right? So what they're doing is creating intra-abdominal pressure. So what you're doing is you're just trying to maintain that neutral spinal position. So if I were to go and pick something up and I didn't have intra-abdominal pressure, I wasn't stable here, I would go to bend over and just flop right over and go to pick it up, and now I've got this rounded back, which a lot of times ends up uh, a herniation, right? Or a disc pops out the back. Um, so intra-abdominal pressure creates rigidity in the spine and protects the spine from injury. Just said that. Herniation, just said that. Always use I, okay. <laughs> Redundancy. Um, in fact, we can go ahead and try this. Um, are we try this? No. Yeah. Yeah, try this. Yeah. yeah. So, Everybody go ahead and sit up nice and tall because, first off, we need the spine to be in a neutral position, right? And this isn't neutral, sitting back. So, remember, we want that nice C-shape curve in the, in the uh, cervical spine, the thoracic, and the lumbar. So, sit up nice and tall, okay? And there's a difference between tall and overextended, okay? Now I'm just throwing more extension into my lumbar spine. So, just nice and tall. I think you got a, a string in the top of your head and you're just pulling up nice and tall. There you go. All right, now here's what I want everybody to do. You're going to take a deep breath in. And you're going to try and let it out, but restrict it. Feel everything's tight? Okay, now relax. Don't hold that for too long because you'll see in a minute why. Uh, we got goodies planned. Uh, but here's what, I want, what else I'd like you to try. Sit up tall again. And when I say create the... That's a big word. Uh, when I say breathe out, try and breathe out, you're going to restrict it. And then what I want you to try and do is put some overextension in your spine. You'll notice that it's very difficult. So right now, stay and relax nice and tall. Overextension. Go ahead and just kind of get those shoulders back. Feel how you can flex through your spine pretty easy, right? Now sit up nice and tall. Now ready? Now try and flex. Feel how it's Ooh. tight. Everything's tight. Okay, let it out. I don't want anybody to hurry. We should have had people sign waivers. Uh, just look over and like veins are popping out of your head. Uh, but did you notice how it was very difficult to open up, to extend, and to flex? That's what I'm talking about. We need to keep everything. We create this shrink wrapping around the spine, and then we protect it through movement. Okay? So what happens when you don't do it right. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Ridiculous. Uh, we need to turn up the uh, audio. Crank it up. Crank it up. Well, that's such an awesome clip. Warning, MTD and the producers insist that no one should any videos of themselves or others performing any dangerous activities. Oh. We will not open or view them. Oh, oh this man. is so bizarre, man. Oh. I'm so buff. I'm so buff. I'm so sleepy. <laughs> 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 I've never seen that before. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Flex yeah. out. What, like dudes in the gym? Like, I'm a dude in the Yeah, sometimes you're like flexing your <laughs> back. And he just flex out. Flex out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like passing out, but you flex out. Okay. But look at this, the weird crew of people watching this flex out. I'm so strong! get to uh i could not get to uh, to link in here for some reason but i gotta make sure you see it anyways um so so this is just another another version of flexing out also notice the spine when he lifts here we not go here we go come on oh. get up get up get up get up, get up, get up. Ah, there it is ah. nice ah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
He's fine. He's all right. He, he does that all the time. Woo! Any more? All the things you can find on YouTube. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's what that's what happens when you uh, when you create too much intra abdominal pressure, uh, you you flex out. So don't do that when you're working out. So we're gonna go through uh, the hinge now. All right. Okay. So the hinge. Now this is important to understand because you'll there's often a misconception of what a squat and what a hinge is. So a hinge. Just think of it as just that. It's a hinge. You're hinging from the from the upper body and the lower body. And this is all coming from the hips, okay? So what you'll see a majority of the time, this is a perfect example right here. And that was what we saw in that video, right? Yeah, that, that's the guy that just passed out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's him. See, he's fine. <laughs> so what, you'll note, what, what you want to make sure you do here is we need the body moving in two pieces, right? Upper body is hinging, and we've got the, the, the torso it needs to stay stable. So we really need to understand the intra-abdominal pressure here. So what I would do first when going to pick something up, make sure my spinal curves are protected. I would get a soft bend in the knee, okay? And I would sit my hips back, keeping my, my, my torso neutral. Notice that as I'm sitting my hips back, okay, I'm not rounding and I'm not overextending, okay? So if I were to go, and we see this all the time, probably the most functional movement you're gonna see throughout your day is going to be the bending over and picking things up, which a lot of times we were talking about, you know, what kind of weight to use with people and things like that. And maybe we'll just use a pillow jokingly, but the reality is some people hurt themselves just picking up very light things because they don't know how to load their spine correctly. And they go to bend over and they herniate or they, they pinch, you know, there's nerve entrapment and they end up with, you know, chronic issue. So we lifting here. Um, another thing you'll see, is people will run out of room basically. They'll run out of slack. Because if I look at the hamstring insertion point, here's the hamstring is real it's mainly what I'm loading up here are the hamstrings. Okay. So a lot of people are most of the time very tight through their hamstrings. So when they're tight, they're not going to open up anymore. So what are people going to do? They're going to default to either knees in or they're going to round to the back. Or worse, they're going to do both. Okay. So that's I guess there's two points there. Make sure you're you're maintaining flexibility or full range of motion throughout all your joints, all your muscles, and understand that you need to load the hips appropriately and keep the spine stiff and neutral as you're bending over to pick things up. Okay. So with that, with that being said, when people try to round or default to a bad position, it's because they try to bend over and they can't go any further. So they're basically stuck with having to round. So what I would say is in a situation like that, drop the hips lower. So I get here, can't go any further, drop the hips down. Now it becomes more of a squat exercise because now my knees, I've got knee flexion with hip flexion. Now it's not just hip flexion. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. Oh, um, and then he's gonna go over a little uh, uh, cool little reflex. Uh, just, you know, uh, keep in mind again, all this stuff is neurologically based. So your body is doing things based on efficiency. So if you're really tight and your hamstrings, like he was saying, you're not even going to think about it. It's just, it's efficient to bend at, at the uh, back, you know, because your, your, your hamstrings are not allowing you to go down. So obviously you've got to get down. Your target is picking up the pillow. So if that means bending here at the, at the back, that's what you're going to do because in that moment, you're not thinking that pillow's down there. My hamstrings have me up here. You know, I got to work those out, you know, and, and you're, you know, it's just that's efficient. Okay, so here's a neat little trick that you can do in the if if you are getting ready to work out, just to loosen things up quick quickly. Understand that this is a neurological process. So everybody, uh, everybody, stand up unless you have an injury that doesn't allow you to uh, to bend forward. Um, uh, do do use your best judgment on this and be careful. But what I want you to do is bend forward and try to touch your toes and just pay really close attention. Just just kind of hang there. Don't don't over force it, but see where you are and kind of measure in inches how far you are from the ground. Okay. So you wanna you wanna see where you are from the ground. Okay. Uh, just however you need to. I mean, just whatever is efficient. That's what you wanna check. Now now stand up. Okay. And what you're gonna do is find basically find your your uh, collarbone here, your clavicle. Okay. Now come down to the rib head right below that. You'll find a gap, okay, where 
uh, right underneath that you'll find a gap in the ribs mm -hmm. okay and then you can find the one right below that too and just rub those points out okay right next to your sternum it's probably gonna come in right next to your sternum okay there's a neurological reflex here I don't know how it works I just remember <laughs> learning it uh, and uh, and what it does is it loosens up all the ligaments and uh, loosens wow. up all the muscles and everything in your body okay so rub that out you'll feel it's sore right yes. but yes. after after rubbing that tightness out of there yeah. okay should be just about there all right now go down and try to touch again and see how far you are from the ground now wow oh, oh my goodness yeah. pause man i got pause <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. No, it's like I can touch my toes. Yeah. So it's just a uh, it's just a, a neat little thing that you can do before working out that gives you an advantage. Okay, it gives you an advantage to where you're not going to be as likely to injure yourself because of tight over tight muscles. Is there a term okay? for that? We can put a couple of toes. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, see, reflexology is probably a good one. I'm out of tricks. So, re maybe reflexology for loosening hamstrings. Yeah. Uh, Alright, so that's it. You guys can have a seat. Alright, Adam, did you flush me? You already killed that? I did. There was one, one little note that I wanted to, to mention. The lifting with back, okay, that's what you always hear. Don't lift with your back. Don't lift with your back. Well, there's a difference when I'm hinging, right? If I'm hinging, in a sense, I am kind of lifting with my back. I'm lifting with my lumbars, right? But only when my spine is stable, okay? So if, if, this, if this is your idea of lifting with your back, then yeah, they're 100% right. Don't lift with your back. But in a sense, I am lifting with my back, but I'm also recruiting these large muscles back here too to lift. So just wanted to throw that out there. You are using some back when you're lifting, but has to be stable. The squat. All right. Um, initially, I had a little guy here. He's a little little Asian guy just sitting like this. And, and uh, he was saying, really? Squatting is bad for your knees? And it's funny because... I traded we, one Asian guy in for six. <laughs> it was a great day. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what you see here is, and, and you'll see this in a lot, of, a lot of third world countries, and not that... I know that might sound bad, like third world countries is how people sit, but in reality, they're more functional and, 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 and they're, yeah, they're in better uh, posture than we are. Um, so what you'll hear a lot of the time is that squatting is bad for your knees, but the reality is a majority of people don't have the mobility necessary to squat. So yeah, when you go to squat and you can't get below parallel here and you try to and you, hurt, you injure your knee, well, of course, you know, squatting is bad for your knee if you're, you know, blowing it out when you're squatting. Um, and if you, if you ever look into uh, Olympic weightlifting, you ever see the Olympic weightlifting, uh, those guys are putting 600 pounds on their back and they're squatting with their butt to the ground, you know, but it's all, I mean, they have full mobility. They're very, very agile, very uh, flexible. Um, so it, it could be, it could be a few different things. Um, there's many different factors. Like I said, there's never just a one size fits all. Everybody's a little different structurally, <laughs> physiologically. Um, a lot of the time it comes from, like I said, the lack of mobility, but it could be, it could be multiple different things. It could be a lack of mobility in the, the quadriceps. I can't get my knees forward enough. It could be a lack of, a majority of the time, it's a lack of ankle mobility, which you're going to see as a result of the shoes, right? Mm -hmm. Because when I go to squat, a real squat should look well, like that, but you'll notice how far my knees go forward and you'll... Oh my gosh, I'm going to tear my I'm pants. still trying to figure out why you wore skinny jeans to this workshop. <laughs> um, but did you notice how did you notice how far how far my knees have to go forward? That's another thing you hear. Don't let your knees go over your toes. Well, yeah, if I if I didn't have any flexion here in my ankles and I ran out of room, again I ran out of space in that muscle, where would my knees want to go? Well, yeah, oh, or they would go in, and this is what you see all the time. This is a common default position for people who lack mobility in their ankles, <laughs> of course you're going to hurt your knees, right? So what we want is knees in line with the toes or even to the outside. The outside is creating a lot of stability in my hip and protecting my knees as well. But as long as the knees are in line with the toes and I have the mobility to get down here and keep my heels on the floor, that's a big one. I, I, have, 
I mean, a majority of people, if I told you to try and squat that low, you'd go right to your toes because you wouldn't have the ankle mobility necessary to get that low. So what can you do? Um, we, unfortunately, we, I don't think we have the enough space to, to get people doing this, but you can try this at home. Oh, we are. Um, oh, huh? we are. Squat oh, yeah. the heels test. Oh, we are. Oh, we are. Right. You guys okay. can try this. Want to give a shot? Are you excited? Yeah, so uh, the squat the heels test. Everybody uh, stand up. Find some space, okay? Here's what you're going to do. Uh, you, does everybody kind of get the mechanics there? So the idea with this test, keep your heels on the ground, okay? And what you're trying to do is you can put your arms out for stability, but what you want to do to see how your flexibility is, is you want to see if you can get all the way down into a full squat with your butt to the ground, keeping your heels on the on the on the ground. <laughs> okay, I may so be able to get down. I may not be able to get up. If you have good flexibility, you should be able to. But most people, you're going to see as they go down, their heels start coming up like this. And if you try to put your heels down, you fall backwards. Okay. Which we'd like. So that's what that's what we're checking is for that stability. So if, you, if you're if you not sure you're going to be able to do it, do it up against the wall. That's fine. You know, but you want to see, can you get your butt all the way down to the way it touches your heels? I actually did. There you go. There you go. With this, no. Dennis shoes, no. You see, a lot of, a lot of you, changing, your, your changing feet are really bowing out. Yeah. I was able to do it. Yeah, it's amazing. Bow out. Bow out. How can I do it? You, you really want to keep pretty much neutral. I mean, like, I see some of them back here. I mean, they're they're coming down like that. Yeah, yeah. So, keep the shoes straight. Yeah. So, also notice, those of you who are squatting, notice where your knees are wanting to stay in alignment with. Are they staying in alignment with your toes, or are they falling to the inside of the toe? If they're falling to the inside of the toe, again, that's your nervous system trying to find a way out. Okay, so yeah, if you're noticing this, don't go any further because all you're doing is loading that you're yourself, right? the, the well, inside of your knee. <laughs> so what I, for this <laughs> test, ideally, toes forward or in a neutral position is best because you're not going to hurt your knees. Well, I can't say you're not going to, but there's a very low chance of you hurting your knees unloaded. I mean, if you're just roasting a marshmallow, you're fine. If you've got a barbell on your back with 300 pounds and you're trying to lift it, then yeah, I would turn the toes out a little bit. Because when I get that low, my knees want, or my femurs want to turn out, but when I keep them in this forward position and I try to go lower, they want to turn out, but the ligaments in here aren't letting them, so I have to turn the toes out just a little bit. But if I go out too far, which, by the way, is another problem with the duck foot stance, is now, right, as my foot's out here, my knee is very vulnerable to yeah. medial rotation, right? And I see that all the time with young athletes. They're here, they're walking around like this, and then they go and do some jump or and they land here, mm -hmm. and over and over again, you end up with a wear pattern there. Mm -hmm. So what, one last little thing that I wanted to mention, if you have somewhere at home, this is what I was really talking about. If you have somewhere at home that's stable that you can hold on to, I wish I could, I don't even know. Like, like, like a pole in the middle of your living room. <laughs> <laughs> or your bedroom. I don't keep it in the living room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, if you have something stable, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not going to fall over on you, okay, disclaimer, <laughs> don't grab onto something that's going to fall on top of you. Oh, we should have um, found a video of that too. Yeah, so we're just going <laughs> to grab onto something and sit back into your heels. I'll bet any of you could sit back into your heels. Back, and Let's say I'm holding onto something, you could probably get here. Yeah. Make sure the knees are in line with the toes. The heel is not coming off the floor. You'll find an end point where as far as you can go, hold that position for two minutes minimum every day. Now, which and it sounds it sounds bad, but when you're holding yourself, it's it's you're just kind of almost relaxing in that position. What you want to do is get your center mass forward enough till over time you can counterbalance here. See, that's essentially what's happening. So I'm going from here and I'm counterbalancing. So that's what you want to do. Over time, regain that ankle flexion until you can get into that position. And it won't take long, but you have to be consistent with it like anything. I have a bad knee. I, well, I told him about the doctor that did the surgery years uh -huh. and years ago when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you know, I used to do um, exercise classes in platform shoes because we were supposed to be cute. Yeah, yeah. I went into 
embarrassing, you know. But anyway, this knee is supposed to have a cyst in there wrapped around everything, uh -huh. and it's gotten real squishy. Right. You know, I, I feel it just squishing it. I mean, right. And it's well, so is yeah. that something that's going to make me better, or am I just going to keep That's a tricky checking? one. Again, that's very individualized. Yeah. Um, we'd, you know, it's, it takes an individual approach to that. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, just because you'd have to look at... I'd be my own judge. Yeah, if, if you're feeling pain, then yeah, I, I wouldn't proceed. I wouldn't try and go through the pain. Pain is your friend. Hey! Yeah, yeah. 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 So listen, listen to pain. That's a feedback system. So um, That's why I wear squishy yeah. shoes every day because mm -hmm. of this. Because if I walk on like my hardwood floors, mm -hmm. they swell. Yeah. And quick, quick caveat again here is there's rarely ever anything like wrong with the knee joint itself a lot of the times the tissues above it and below it because they're all inserting into that knee joint right so they're usually taking the the brunt of what's happening in here and down here uh -huh. so you might want to look into maybe some foam rolling for the quadriceps and the hamstrings and loosening up those areas but if it was a if it was a procedure you know it's difficult to say exactly what it is but if you're he trying didn't, he didn't do anything he, he left the cyst this was supposed to be wrapped around everything uh -huh. and um but I started noticing this fall that when I was building on something and mm -hmm. I would use my knees this is really just squishy yeah I mean, you can almost yeah. hear it you can feel it so oh <laughs> that was a great like description <laughs> I was just there um well that I would imagine that uh what do we call that thing the vibe. The vibe. The vibe. <laughs> I'd imagine that'd be great for stabilization for the joint without actually having to move it through range of motion. Spider um, tape. Yeah. Same thing. So what I would focus on is just foam rolling and loosening up those tissues that over time, if you can't use them functionally, they're just going to eventually, again, the, the nervous system's not going to see that's being used and find use for something else. So then, how do I find out about the foam rolling? Um, I can tell you more about it. In fact, I've okay. got I've got some made in my car. Okay. I know it's yeah. I don't know why, but I I could give you <laughs> like I can explain why. But I and you know what you can have one. Made on um, a mission. Yeah. Made yeah. on a mission. That's right. That's right. Um, and I can I can give you one then. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. The press. Uh, burgers posture. This is another little uh, trick that we're going to show you. Everybody, go ahead and stand up again. Wait. Sit down. So go ahead and sit down. Sit down. <laughs> you gotta do it right. Everybody say concentric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so burger's posture. The way that you do this is uh, basically you're gonna bring your feet out shoulder width apart. Okay. Turn your your hands, your palms out with your shoulders back. Okay. Palms out, shoulders back, and then you're gonna pull your chin back. Okay. And you should feel your back muscles contracting. Mm -hmm. I don't feel anything. No? Uh, <laughs> That's because he's more so functional. So just pull back on that. And what you're doing is you're contracting. You want to feel basically like you're, like you're trying to squeeze something in between your shoulders. Okay? So you're just pulling everything back. You notice your extensor <laughs> muscles are pulling back. Your, your shoulder muscles are pulling back in this way. Everything is going into extension. Okay? That's, that's now relax. And you'll notice that instantly your posture is better. Mm -hmm. This is another one of those. Yeah, okay, I told you I didn't have any more. This is one more. So one more <laughs> neat little neurological trick. Uh, this is how you overcome this uh, this forward slumping because people are constantly in flexion. Okay, this is over overdoing it, but you know the monkey form where your everything is in flexion all the time, and so you can overdo that by turning your palms out. And pulling back like that. Another example would be if you put your back up against a wall and you maintain that posture, pull it out, and then you want to be able to, I don't know why I'm duck footing it out, but uh, you pull your shoulders back and you should be able to get your arms all the way up over your head with keeping your hands, basically keeping your knuckles up against the wall. So imagine you're up against a wall and you're coming all the way down. A lot of people have problems with that. They can't get their arms back all the way while keeping their shoulders and their head all up against the wall. That's an extension problem and that shows you that you're over flexed. So think about that from a chiropractic standpoint because as long as you're over flexed like this, you see how I'm working uphill because I'm trying to fight against you flexing like this all, all day long and I'm trying to get you up to this. 
Okay, so the more you can do that posture and practice that at home and get that extension in there, the better. Okay, cool stuff, huh? Yep. All right, everybody say. Jesus. Oh, remember, very nice. That's exciting. Uh, so we talked about if the body can't get into a certain position, it's going to default to a dysfunctional position, right? And oh man, I might have to ask you guys to stand again. Do you mind? Do, yeah. do you mind one more concentric? Yeah. One more concentric. Good. Okay. So here's what I want everybody to do. Go ahead and just put your arms up as high as you can, keeping your biceps as close to your ear as you can. Now, what were we talking about when we were talking about the spine? What do we need to maintain when, whenever we're moving? Spinal curves, right? We need to maintain the, the neutral spinal position. Now, remember what this is, this is overextension, right? When I'm overextending through my back. So how many of you are feeling some overextension through your spine right now to get to this position here? Now, here's what I want you to do. Put your arms down by your side. And if you were able to get to that position with a neutral spine, good on you. That means you have good shoulder mobility because what we're looking for is 180 degrees of flexion. You should be able to see that ear peeking out. But what you'll notice with this guy is, one, he can't get his shoulders in that position. But what is he doing? See this rib cage, how it's getting this kind of yeah. up position? That means he's throwing overextension into his spine, which mm -hmm. means you're exposing that, that lumbar spine to danger when you're putting things overhead or whenever you're doing any kind of pressing motion. So here's what I want everybody to do. Intra-abdominal pressure again, okay? Let's flex out. So here's what I want you to do. You're gonna breathe, you're gonna do the intra out. Um, so, so the whole point of that exercise, was some of you may have been like, no, I don't, I don't get it. But really what we're talking about is can you maintain 180 degrees of shoulder flexion, which is the functional shoulder position when pressing overhead, while maintaining a neutral spine without exposing my spine to danger. Right, so next time think about that when you go to it doesn't matter what it is cans from the grocery store Okay, or dog food overhead. Just think Keep that midline stabilized to keep the spine protected. You don't have to Overhead, you know, but just make sure that you're not getting into that overextension <laughs> So um, all right, this is a very, very important one. How many of you guys get kind of like pain in your shoulder more on the anterior part right in here, kind of the front side of the shoulder, like almost like a pinch? Does anybody get that in their shoulder, like a pinch? Okay, well that's commonly referred to as the uh, shoulder impingement. And that's due to a lot of this, right, the internal rotation. So again, if we can fix our posture, a lot of time we can get out of that. But a lot of the time, if we go to move within that position, so what happens is I, I rotate this, the top of this bone here, right? It has all these attachments and I rotate it. And when I go to lift things overhead, I close the gap in there and I pinch off tissue in there. So I get that, oh, I get that kind of pinchy frozen shoulder feeling. You can't get your arm any higher. So what we're going to talk about is it's kind of a, kind of sounds like a scary big term, but external rotation. And just think about that as external moving away outside and rotation. Okay, so what I want you to do is grab the back of the chair in front of you and just keep your, keep your hands planted on it. And what we're doing is we're just creating an anchoring point so I can externally rotate. So if I grab here, now what I, I don't have anything to grab. Now what I want you to do, yeah, thank you. That's perfect. Right. Okay, now what I want you to do is take the pit of that elbow and I want you to drive it away. See how I, I'm able to rotate? See that? That's external rotation. So what I'm doing is I'm packing that joint in a stable position and safe position into the into the capsule in here. So that way I can avoid that impingement when moving overhead. So if I were to grab something, next time you go to grab something, again, can of soup, well, probably not a can of soup, maybe like a bucket of some kind. And what you, you're gonna do is you're gonna plant your hands and get that external rotation, okay? And you'll notice that the shoulder, you know how the shoulder blades almost kind of lock into position? Boom, you're ready to go right now, okay? <laughs> so think about this also. And this applies to lifting things too. If I go to lift something up with that internal rotation, what's happening is I've got all this space in the joint. Okay? What I want to do is I want to create stability and take that space away so I don't have room for, for rupture or tears or anything like that. So think about pulling a car out of a ditch. If you pulled a car out of a ditch, you connected a chain to the back of your car and then to the bumper of the car, you wouldn't go driving out of there as fast as you could, right? Because then what would happen? You'd rip the bumper off the car. So it's the same thing. If I go to pick something up, but I don't have that position locked in, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm putting all that jarring into that joint because it's loose. It's just kind of rolling around in there. 
So what do we do? We slowly take out the slack in the joint, lock it into position, and then pull the car out of the out of the ditch. You like that analogy? Yes. All right. So you just described a good adjustment, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's 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 what that's what's trained in chiropractic school. That is often missed is bringing the joint to lock out. That's what uh, if anybody ever has had their head just whipped around. <laughs> You know, that's that's called that's that's called ripping the bumper off. Yeah, <laughs> I love analogies. So just keep that in mind. Get this, get the joint into its most stable, safe, efficient position, and then execute the movement because because it's going to become a subconscious thing after a while. But you have to be conscious for it long enough for your nervous system to say, "Okay, I recognize this. Let's go ahead and get the body into a safe position." Okay, so it'll take some work, take some conscious effort for a little while. Yeah, it's worth it. Trust it. All right, stations. So we're going to go through uh, anybody that wants to stay for this part. Uh, we're going to actually break up into two stations. And uh, Ryan is going to take over one. I'm going to take uh, – so he's going to be going through the kettlebell station. I'm going to do the push-up squat press station. And we're gonna, just going to show you some basic exercises that you can do at home. And what, and what we're going to do is we're going to first – Make sure that you're going through the right motions, making sure that your form is correct. Then we're going to do a weight test to make sure that you're using the right amount of weight to do that exercise. And then we're going to watch you actually do the exercise and coach you through that exercise so that we know you're doing it right. So that literally you could go to Academy or Walmart or somewhere and pick up a kettlebell. You know what size to pick up. You know what you you are ready to use. You just go, you buy it, and you replicate it at home. Okay? Until, huh? until your muscles get used to it. Until your muscles get used to it, and then you got to upgrade. Progression, yep. right? Going a little and then further. You, and then you pass it down to your kids. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're going to go ahead and break up into stations. If we can take all the chairs, and don't throw them up against the wall, but, but, but uh, use concentric motions to push them in that direction. I just had a chance to kind of work on that squat a little bit, but first we're going to make sure that everybody can squat all right uh, before we start lifting any weight, okay? So let's have you guys go ahead and spread out just a little bit for me. Now we're just going to go over the, it, it's going to vary from person to person because everybody has different hip width and different leg, uh, leg length, so it's going to vary, but typically where we want our feet is just outside shoulder width with my toes slightly pointed outward. Okay. Now, again, what we want to focus on is breaking at the knees and the hips simultaneously. So what we want to avoid is this and this. We want a little bit of the both. Okay. So when I say break, I want everybody to go ahead and break at the knees and the hips. Okay. Good. Okay. Go ahead and stand. Good. Now I'm seeing some really forward knee position. Okay. And that's that's what we want to try and stay away from. And again, that's the that's these things back here trying to shut down because they become dysfunctional over time. So again, try and break and make a conscious effort to really sit the butt back a little bit. As if you're, there you go, just like that. As if you're going to reach back into a chair. Good. Feel how those knees are wanting to come forward? Now, think about dropping your chest just a little bit more. So stand up, ready, break, sit the butt back, drop the chest forward. There you go, that's better. Feel how you're hinging now with a little bit of knee bend. That feels better. This feel better? Good. It, it, it should. And that's why, again, that's where the knee pain comes in on the squatting. Uh, okay, so if, if that felt okay, what we're going to have people do is you can, everybody just, you're going to come up and just give it a shot and see what it feels like. Um, I'm going to have you guys try out the differences between a hinge, which I'm going to show you guys. So do you, does anybody remember what we were talking about with the hinge? That the hinge is going to be a soft bend in the knee. Okay? And it's all coming from the hips. Remember, think hinge, right? Like my body's moving, like the hinge is moving in two pieces. So I'm going to sit my butt back, okay? Keeping the knees soft, soft bend in the knees. And some of you, again, see how my chest is neutral here or my spine is neutral? Now, some of you are going to want to get to this. If you get here, catch yourself, or I'll keep an eye on you. Make sure you don't do it. And you're going to sit the butt back down a little bit further. Now, notice how this becomes more of a squat position because we're compensating for that lack of hamstring flexibility. So I want you to try it. I'm going to have everybody come up one at a time. We'll take a look at you. And we'll decide whether the hinge is going to be better to pick things up or if you need to squat a little more because you're compensating for the lack of flexibility. Okay? So do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Let's have you go first. And um, let's actually grab a couple. Let's get a couple other people. Let's do this. I guess we shouldn't do firsts. Let's do a... Then you guys will think that I'm... 
I have favorites, which I care about all of you equally. <laughs> okay. So let's let's go ahead and get two here. So you you, you want to lift that one up? Yeah. All right. Let's move that up here. Just that way. Well, yeah. Let's do this. You see that? Okay, so let's okay. get you yeah. here, and I don't want anyone to lift anything just yet. I want to go ahead and get everyone into uh, into a good position first. So go ahead and yeah, let's let's just get somebody just randomly run up to one. I'm gonna have him go ahead and try that one. Okay, so don't lift yet. Let's get you. Yeah, you wanna get on that one, bud? And then hey, Danielle, why don't we get you on that? All right. So the closer the object, the more control I'm going to have over it, and the less my body's going to have to compensate to reach out and keep control over it. So I want you guys to almost be straddling that thing. Get, get nice and close to it. Good. Now it should be directly underneath you almost. Now, everybody, go ahead and get a soft bend in your knee. Now keep that chest nice and tall. Remember, you got a string attached to the top of your head that's pulling you nice and tall. I'm maintaining my natural spinal curves. And what I want you to do is sit your butt back, allow that chest to come forward, really sit that butt back. Now, how many of you are running into problems here? You feel like you got to round a little bit in the back, or can you maintain that position? You can maintain I feel like it's a little bit, a lot of stress in the lower back. Though. A lot of stress? Okay, so if you continue to sit your butt back and let that chest come forward, you feel that stress increase? No, it decreases. It's, it's, it's gone. Okay, good. So go ahead and continue to hinge if you feel okay. Okay, feel good, 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 good. Everybody okay? Starting to run out a little flexibility there? Yeah. Okay, so notice how you're having to drop the hips down. Again, it could be jeans, and I feel you on that. Cause, uh, no? Okay, <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what I want you to do is go ahead and can you descend the hips any further than where you were? See, that's a good that's a good back position, by the way. Good, good, good. Now go ahead and grab that kettlebell handle. Now, keeping that chest up nice and tall, go ahead and drive those hips through. Now, that's 50 pounds, so if it feels... Like it's going to be a problem, just go ahead and let it down. But if you maintain that spinal position, you should be good. Drive those hips through. Stand. Okay, now here's very important. When we're putting it down, a lot of people want to get, they want to rush and go ahead and set it down around it. Go ahead and soft bend in the knee again. Keep that chest tall. Sit in the butt back and hinge right back how you picked it up initially. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so do you see, do you see kind of the variations there? How some had to... They ran out of flexibility and they had to drop the hips down and turn it into more of a squat. Okay, and that's functional application in the real world. If you go to pick something up, okay, drop the hips down if you have to compromise spinal position. Well, is it healthy just to bend over like that? As if the as spine is in position, yeah, if the spine so is in position. I can do this and when it's yep. not going to compromise. Yep. Yeah, you can do that. That's fine. So for those of you who were able to pick it up and hinge, all right, in fact, we'll go ahead and show everybody this one. Go ahead and get back down into position, grab the kettlebell. Chest nice tall, don't worry, I'll get around to you guys and we'll go through all this. Okay, now, so go ahead and stand it up. Remember, keep that spine neutral, drive those hips through. Now, here's what I want you to do. We're gonna go over the swing, okay? And I'm, not, I'm actually having you guys back up just a little bit. <laughs> Good, now the swing, it's a hinge. That's essentially what the, the, the kettlebell swing is. Okay, yeah, make sure you're hanging onto it tight, okay? Now, what I want, again, a soft bend in the knees, and I'm going to load my hips up by dropping that chest forward. And what I'm doing is I'm creating kind of this rubber band effect, right? I'm winding up some, some, uh, some torsion right here. And then from here, notice everything's locked into position. And then I'm going to squeeze my butt as tight as I can. We're keeping my arms locked in. Don't try and lift it overhead. And just drive your hips through. Keep your arms straight. There you go. And you should feel like, yeah, that's going to be a heavy one. So, so yeah, just focus on uh, just focus on this, guys. Opening the hip and driving, and really be aggressive with that with that drive. Okay, that that looks good. And open the hips. Yeah, feel how you generated some motion there. Okay, so go ahead. And everybody, set that down for a second. I want to demonstrate just a kettlebell swing real quick. Okay, so the kettlebell swing is. It's, it's the epitome of a hinge. Okay? I'm, I'm hinging at the hip and I'm driving with my, my hamstrings, my glutes, and my lumbar spine. Everything's locked into position and I'm using all this extension to generate power. So you'll notice when I'm first starting the kettlebell swing, I'll get into a good tall position and I'll break it knees softly and I'll drive my hips back, torso forward, and then I'm going to squeeze. And if I continue this motion, right, see how it starts getting a little higher, right? But it, it all comes down to me being able to close my hips efficiently and keep my torso nice and long. If I, yeah, that's essentially what it is. So when people watch kettlebell swings and they're like, oh, I can do that, and they try and like lift it up. You're not really, yeah. that's not what you're trying to work no, out. No, right, right. So it's not as impressive as it looks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but it teaches you how to use these hinging muscles, these extension muscles, with efficiency. 
Okay, so let's um, let's try that one more time. What I want you guys to do is just get a little bit of momentum going and give me about five swings with a little bit more swing on each one. The highest I want you guys to go is maybe eye level, but if you feel this happen, stop immediately. Okay, because remember that chest needs to stay up tall, spine needs to stay neutral. Okay, so go ahead and sit the butt back. Okay, good. Remember, we're opening up. We're hinging now. Squeeze and let it come back down. Open, squeeze. Good. That's a good swing. That's a great swing. Good. Yep. Yep. And especially with 50 pounds, you got to really drive. you got to really drive those hips through. Good. Very nice swing, man. Good. All right. Go ahead and set it down. Okay, so the whole idea to go through that was to show you the different transitions in lower body movement, right? The squat is essentially going to be a combination of knee bending with hip bending, right? And then the hinge is going to be more predominantly hinging here. But this is also very, uh, this is determined by hamstring flexibility. If I don't have that, sometimes you need to compensate here. But just always remember, prioritize and protect your spine. Okay, if you have to compensate, find another way, but make sure that it's an efficient position. That's why we went over all the fundamental movements today, was so you know what efficiency and safety looks like and you can identify it, okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. This would be great because, see, it's still at a good incline, okay? You know, you can still turn your arms out and then come straight down into this position right like that. And it's stable. So, you know, and I wouldn't do it on this though. Yeah. So you might try this one and see it might it might actually be easier. Yeah, that, that seems like it would be. Now see she's tall too, so she's working against leverage as well. Yeah, far enough. Yep. So go ahead and get a little bit closer. Good. So we know that you have a tendency to want to really drive those knees. So good. Good form. Okay, so see, she was able to do that. There was a little bit of quiver there, but this would be a good starting point for her. Okay, and then once once you get to that point where where it's like this is no problem whatsoever, then you progress, then you drop it down, and pretty soon you know you, you can get to the point where you're doing inverted push-ups, right? Okay, so uh, did everybody else kind of get that down form and everything? Okay, good. Um, so the next one we're gonna do is we're gonna do the uh, we're gonna do the swap press. So this one merges everything together, but uh, you want to, we're going to first test weight and see is the weight correct. For most people, you're going to find that the press is actually the limiting, uh, the limiting factor. Okay, so you're going to start at the lowest weight. Okay, so who wants to volunteer for this one? Okay, so... Here's your weights. Don't How much so. weight's that, Dr. Mark? Okay. okay, so now just go ahead and turn your biceps out, curl that up. Okay, now press that up to the ceiling. Okay, and then and then come back down slowly. Okay, so we're going to go up and we're going to go back down slowly. That felt pretty easy, Dennis. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a little weight now. Okay, I'm going to say... We're gonna go up to six. Yes, yes. Um, I know that when I go to number two, even though I'm pretty limber, you, you know, that's gonna be pretty. It could either be the muscles are tight and they're stretching, or purposefully picking these. So, okay, go ahead and pull that up now. Come up slowly. Okay, and then you're gonna go into a slow press. Right. Okay, now what I want to watch on her is I want to see that everything is maintaining good alignment. She's right. not folding back here. She's not going like this. She's not going like that. Okay, now drop that down, back down slowly. Okay, how do you feel like with that? Did that feel like you were really forcing it? <laughs> not too bad, but I couldn't do a lot of reps. Okay, okay, so let's. So that's kind of the point with that one. So let's drop that down just one notch. Okay. Sometimes you have no choice but to get down and squat down and grab it. And you still have to make sure you have a good spine position when you're up. So this is probably going to be about right for you, and I, I bet you for most most of the women here, that's going to be about the right amount of weight. Okay. So now that is 
uh, 10 pounds each. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, what you're going to do there, uh, go ahead and start down. That's much easier, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, get in good form. Okay. I want you to break at the knees and the hips at the same time. So, you're kind of in a squat. Your butt's coming back just a little bit, and your head is in the neutral position. Okay? So, everybody sees the position that she's in. Now, from there, your feet are straight forward, shoulder width apart. You're going to drop straight down into a squat. Not too far, just to where it's comfortable. Then you're going to come up, okay? Rotate out, curl that up, then roll and press that all the way up. Then come back down, back into the position, drop that down, turn it, and squat again, okay? And let's go ahead and do, let's say let's do 10 of those. Okay. Don't go too fast. Watch your motion. Make sure that you got the mechanics right. What we're doing here, when you start this, you're just training the motion. You're training the muscles so that you know that form. Once you get used to it, it's going to be automatic, and you can replicate it. And you can do it a lot faster. It's you know, it's like a soccer player. They don't just go out and start doing what they do. They have to work their way into it. It's muscle memory. Right? If I'm going here, you can feel it right back here. And How's stuff. that feel? <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't even know where I'm at on my camp. Sorry. I lost count at three. I know. Uh, Alright, I think that's five. Okay, let's speed that up just a little bit. You're you're finally getting the you're getting the muscle memory. So down, roll up, curl, press the straight, back down and curl, drop, squat. There you go. Roll it back up, press the straight. Good. Come back, down and squat. There you go. I think we got three more, right? One. Good. Drop down. Good. Let's just do one more. There we go. All right. Bonus. All right. And drop down. Now, okay, when you go to set down the weight, you should be a little bit fatigued. Okay, so you want to make sure that you guard your form when you're doing this. This would be the hinge, okay, or the straight down squat. If you can do the squat all the way, then you do it that way. But and you know, if you just look at the way that he was doing the hinge, keep your keep your body tight and press it down, just like that. But ideally, it would be to just go down into a squat. I always do that because it protects your lumbar spine better. You just a lot of people. That's where they get hurt is when they're putting the weights down because they're exhausted and they're like, oh, you know, and they throw it down. Oh, you know, all of a sudden their back pops out. Okay. Okay, so let's just start. Uh, let's just start at. Well, you can you can probably do this one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So watch your form. Go down into a good squat. Go down and kill Yeah. Okay. Now go ahead and roll that up into the curl. And we're just going to try the press. So slow up. Okay, now hold it. Hold it. Right there. Do you see how he's really curving in the back? So you want to tighten up your abs. Go ahead and drop that down. Go ahead and drop that down. Okay. And go like that. Here's what I want to do. Let me see those. I'm going to drop that down. Just make sure we get your form right first. Yeah, your form was, was off. So uh... This is, oh, this is a perfect is example of recruitment, though, right? because so what did we talk about? Your body's all about efficiency of motion. So if it's efficient to go like this, then that's what you're going to do. That's right. But it's really, ultimately, it's about mobility. Okay, so we're going to take it from there. And what I want you to do, go ahead and keep that posture real good. I want you to tighten up your abs. Yeah. Okay? So bring your, bring your weights out in front of you. Hang on. Just, just bring the weights like this in, in neutral right here. I want to start right here. Head back, okay? Bring your abs in a little bit. Yeah. Right there is good posture. You guys see that? That's good posture. Yeah, that's good. Now, bring the weights out in front of you, just in front of your leg, and go ahead and curl, okay? Hold right there. Your abs came out, okay? So keep that tight. Now, go ahead and press from right there. Go ahead and press that up to the ceiling. Okay. Now, keep the abs tight. Okay. 
Bring that, bring your abs down in a little bit. Feels weird, doesn't it? Okay. Honestly speaking, okay, because this is this is not a strength issue. You guys saw it. he's got the strength to get it up, but it's it's positioning. So in your case, I actually wouldn't go above that. I would not go above ten until you get your posture loosened up and until you can do that motion without doing this. Okay? So that would be the weight that I would stay at, just 10 pound dumbbells. That's right. That's, that's, this is a good lesson. It is. Okay, let's try the full motion now. So drop down into a curl, now go into a squat. Okay, now in, in your squat too, that's, that's actually not bad. Okay, come back up. When he started to go down, you guys saw he went like this first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he dropped his shoulders forward. You want to come down all in one motion. Yeah, and really make sure that you're keeping this tight. Yeah. Okay. Back up. There we go. Already improving dramatically. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Come back up. Tighten those abs. Tighten those abs. No, bring that forward. Just like that. There yeah. we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now drop that back down. Curl it down. Okay. Go back down into a squat. Okay. Huge improvement. Yes. Yes. Huge improvement. That's the whole purpose of this. We want to see that kind of stuff happen so that now I know he's safe to go home and do this stuff and replicate. It. Okay. Just don't lean back. You just, gotta keep this yeah, tight. You gotta be real careful because you can pinch up your SI joints and your lumbar spine. And, and that'll you, hurt if the neck. weights are heavy enough, <laughs> yeah, you've you, 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 you been doing like that guy. Yeah, flex it out. <laughs> okay, cool. Flex out. Oh, that was All right. good. That was good. Uh, who's next? Who's next? You will? Okay. I will. Let's, let's start here. Okay. She's a beast. I know she can do that. Okay. All right. So bring, come into a curl right there. Okay. Bring that up. Good posture. Okay. Now press all the way up. Okay. Actually, she does pretty good with this, right? There's, uh, we could use a little bit more shoulder uh, motion, come back this way more. So you can use a little bit more here, but that's just a flexibility issue, okay? Uh, so go ahead and come back down. All right, drop that down, turn them out, and then go into a squat. Okay, very good. Back up. Okay, turn that out. Curl and press up. Very good. Okay. That's it. That's it. Really? Yeah. I did it. You did it. Wow. Yeah. Now that that's probably so for you guys. Just go and get a ten pound pair of dumbbells. I got it. And you guys can both you guys can both work on the same weights because you know that's that's good for your. Uh, yep. That's good for your strength level. Is going to be right about there. And with you, it's just it's just a matter of getting the flexibility there. All right. Okay. Who's next? <laughs> I'm learning so much. Okay. So let's let's practice the squat first. Okay. Before we pick up the weight, so straight down into a squat. Keep keep your butt back and keep your head back as you go down. Very good. Okay. Good. You're nailing the squat. Okay. Alright, now, so go ahead and from that position, turn your biceps yeah. out and curl that up. Okay, now try the press. I think this might be... Ah, she did better than I thought. Yeah, I can do it, but they're heavy. Okay, alright, now drop that back down. Okay, now go down into the squat. Okay. A little bit of instability, mainly in the knees on this one. Yeah, you can you can tell she her knees shimmy just a little bit. So you might you might even want to go a little bit lighter on these until you get that stability there. So let's let's go ahead and drop that down. Uh, let's go down to five pounds. But like I said, go ahead and see. Like I said, I was getting very comfortable first. She just got a little bit of 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 a little bit and curl that up. Good. Now press straight up. Try to get your, your biceps basically up against your ears. Okay. That's good. That's really good position. 
you see how she's in it. 180. I mean, that's that's an awesome position for me. I'm proud of you. Okay, got that down. Okay, come down like this. And let's go down into a perfect squat. All right. That's it, right there. So let's knock out five of those. Go ahead and just speed up the tempo just a little bit. One. Okay. Press. One. Okay. There we go. Down. It's, like, <laughs> it's all knees on that. You see that? So, so slow down when you hit that one. She's good. she's a beast in the shoulders though. She's got that. Two. Okay. Come back up. That's good. Press. Three. Very good. Awesome. Good. Next one. Four. It's all from your hips. Good. Good. Yep. Keep yeah, your head so back on that squat. Good. You, there is a little and shoulder involvement. Five. As I pick up momentum, Good. I can lift my shoulders up a little higher. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, now remember what I just said. Don't here. buckle after you're done. That's when you, that's when you're tired. That's when you become the most cautious. Is when you're putting down the weights. That's when you guard the most. Absolutely. It's it's always when I'm putting down the weights that I'm really paying attention to making sure that I'm not doing anything stupid in that last second. The the exercise is great until you hurt yourself at the end. Okay. You want to go? All right. Let's just start with uh, let's start with five. Okay. So go ahead and curl that up. All right. Now let's go into the press. Arms all the way up against your ears. Okay. There we go. Okay. Good. Now back down slow. Good. Drop into a curl. Okay. And go down into a squat. Okay. Good. Back up. All right. How's that weight feel? A little easy. A little, little bit. Okay, let, let's try a 10. Let's just see how you do with a 10. Because remember, results don't come from easy. I've been working on, I plan for 10 minutes. We're going to go over this real quick. But the reality is, if you really want to learn these movements, you need to All right. Okay, go ahead and curl up. A little on the heavy side. Okay, let's try that. But you, you can do it. And... There was a little bit of her, her shoulders, you can tell they buckle in just a little bit as she goes up to that. So that's probably a little bit on the heavy side. Okay, so we'll drop that back down to five. There we go. Okay, so let's knock out, let, let's do uh, eight of these. So let's go straight from the top, go down into a squat, and finish in the press. And good form, good. Bring your chin up just a little bit on these, there you go. Okay, drop that back down. Uh, wait, on that one, from here, make sure you curl down. You were already turning in as you came down. Okay, drop down, good. Good. All right. Oh, that looks really good. Two, very good. That's all. There you go. Curl down. This is all about the muscle memory. So, see, you're creating that muscle memory by going through the exercise slowly and just learning that pattern. Get a friend, get a partner. You do five, okay. she does five, you do ten, you do ten, and so you can't complete that set. Yeah, very good. That's a great one. Okay. All right, we got, we got All right. Good. Um, four. Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and get with. Five. Good. Three, two, four. start with just five with you okay all right so good form 
hips slightly back, okay? Remember the break at the hips and the knees at the same time for the squat. Okay, good. Now, go ahead and curl that straight up and then roll your wrist as you go into a press. Good. Okay, from right there, how's that feel? Does that, does that feel pretty easy? Bring your shoulders back just a little bit. There you go. How does that feel? So, am I over? I don't know if I could take any more because I haven't nice used my energy. arms and so remember, a lot. Okay. You know, okay. Okay, so now. since we're doing Maybe more repetitions, let's just stay at five minutes. Okay. So, okay. so from there, let's keep your drop it down. Up. Okay, okay. bring your down into the curl. Roll now, down, go into the squat. Back. Okay, back up, good. Okay. Curl I'm up, press back. up. Good. Position. Back Nothing down, move. good. You catch curl down, and squat. Continue. Very good. Up. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> See, until you create that muscle, that muscle memory, it's really hard to get the pattern. So start slow. Because what you'll find, if you just start rapidly going into it, you're going to do that. You're just going to, you know, be throwing the weights around without doing the right form. There you go. Very good. Okay. You can already see the, the quiver just start to shake in the arms a little bit there. Not for long. I'm going to do this. They forgot their function. So stand up one okay, time and good. now think about really reaching those hips back with more. So you're probably going to want to start at, say, you know, 10 reps at a time.